Great. Um, well, welcome to this session on um, with Lauren Lipinski. Lauren is uh, the Capacity Building Analytics Manager from Feeding America. Uh, Lauren, thank you for joining us. And we actually just had a, a, a kickoff session at 11 a.m. this morning, which Lisa Scales, who's with us here again, CEO and President of the Pittsburgh uh, uh, Food Bank, introduced uh, her operations and the service mission of the food bank. So this is really an excellent opportunity for us to now hear about Feeding America and what Feeding America does and how you're also using analytics to be able to support food banks and kind of raise awareness for the issue of food insecurity and hunger. So with that, Lauren, I'd like to pass it over to you. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I was really excited when Lisa and then Chris invited me to come participate in this um, I graduated from a public policy program two years ago where data analytics was the focus of my work and did a lot of partnerships with nonprofits similar to what you all are about to engage on. And it was such a critical and important part of my education. And I'm just thrilled to see that you all are using your brain power and talent to benefit um, Lisa and the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. Um, and really take using data and your skills to tackle food insecurity. And so what I wanted to do, I know you've heard about what the food bank is doing here in your local community, but kind of wanted to take a little bit of time to share with you um, more about Feeding America and what our organization does and how that interfaces with food banks across the country, like um, the Pittsburgh Food Bank here. Um, I'll also go over a little bit about what food insecurity means um, and how that's measured, because I think that could be applicable to the work that you're going to engage in. And then just as you know, a data person talking to other data folks, I wanted to share a little bit with you about what my day-to-day -day work looks like and how I interact with data. And then also some of the grounding principles that I've kind of learned throughout my career um, that really guide me and anchor me in a lot of the work that I'm going to do. So I've put together um, a deck just to kind of visualize and kind of let you walk through and see what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing that um, in just a moment. Um, if I can find it on here. Should be the um, green button at the below at share screen. Yeah, I have that. I'm just not seeing. Um, my PowerPoint showing up as an option of something to share. And then you can look at that. So I'm just gonna head roll with it and go. So um, first off, wanted to share a little bit about um, what is Feeding America and who we do, um, who we are and what we do. Um, so we are um, the nation's largest domestic hunger relief organization. Um, and not just that, but we're the second largest domestic charity in the United States. Um, and so what that actually means in application and practice um, is that, you know, Feeding America, we view ourselves as um, having, you know, being one and the same with food banks. So we are a national office, but we're also um, a network of food banks across the country. So 200 food banks um, call themselves members of the Feeding America network. And so how that works is that food banks, um, they are in your community and they're distributing millions of meals each year. And then nationally, um, at a national office, Feeding America supports those food banks by connecting them to funds, food, expertise, um, and partners. So food banks can feed more people today and help communities build better in the future. And why we view this as such an important model for our work of having this, you know, this national movement, but that's grounded in community and local level needs is because we think that together we are bigger, better, and stronger than the sum of our parts. So how can we use our efforts and resources on a national level to, to grow and support every all the work that's being done on an, a local level? And so with that, um, I have this really lovely map to show you um, that was a map of the whole country. Um, and it shows um, shaded in one color how uh, if the map is shaded and it means that it's being served by a member of the Feeding America Network. And what's really exciting and cool about that map is that the whole entire map for the whole country is shaded in which means that every single corner and county of this country, including Puerto Rico, is being served by a member of the Feeding America Network. So there is no part of this country that is left untouched or overlooked when it comes to ending food insecurity. And what's really interesting and what I'm always very humbled about by this work is just the power of numbers and the power of a networked organization. And so, you know, like I said before, we have a national office which is a network of 200 food banks across the country. But then if we dig deep and look at who, you know, the organizations that all those food banks are working with, their food pantries, their agencies, you know, their meal programs, that totals being, you know, more than 60,000 other organizations across the country. So just that, you know, 
you know, thousands upon thousands of organizations are all working together um, to collaborate on a shared goal of ending hunger in the country. So just the sheer number and scale of the work that's going on is always a humbling thing to be a part of. Um, and so with that, now that you kind of have an idea of who Feeding America is um, and, you know, why we exist, want to go over a little bit about what food insecurity is. And so what food insecurity um, is the lack of consistent access to enough food for an active and healthy life. And so this measure is developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is the USDA. And so as part of the um, current population survey, which is a census survey that goes out every month in December, they include something called this food security supplement. And so that's this questionnaire that really digs into if households and families were able to afford enough groceries for the week, if they ever had to skip meals because they couldn't afford, you know, to, to purchase groceries and start getting all these questions that then can be um, aggregated into a food insecurity rate across the country. And so the USDA has an annual report called the Household Food Insecurity in the United States Report, and it's going to provide national and state level food insecurity rates. Um, and I think that's like a really great starting point when you're all about to jump into this work. It's kind of familiarizing yourself with that report, with the, the tools and the measures that they use to create this, because that's kind of like the, the gold star or the anchor of a lot of the work that we're engaging in. And so how that all works is that in 2020, 38 million um, Americans uh, faced hunger. And so that's about one in eight individuals. And that number, no matter how many years I work on this issue or, you know, am invested in this network, it always shocks me how high that is and really illustrates that food insecurity and hunger is, is kind of invisible in a lot of ways. You know, you wouldn't know by looking at your neighbor or your um, classmate or your colleague that they have um, str struggled or experienced food insecurity, um, but it is very pervasive. And, you know, one in eight individuals in this country had experienced it at some point in time just in 2020. Um, so, like I said before, the USDA puts out a report um, that focuses on the national and state level food insecurity rates, um, but then here at Feeding America, recognizing that so much of this work to end food insecurity is grounded in local level efforts, uh, we have a report called Map the Meal Gap, which models food insecurity rate down to the county and congressional district level. So we really hope that that's a tool that can empower uh, food banks on the ground to better um, visualize and see how food insecurity looks in their in their you know neighborhoods and in their localities to then inform you know how they proceed forward with the programs and where they're targeting services. And so that's a really fun um, if you're interested in regressions and all sorts of modeling that's a fun report to take a deep dive into. Um, we use that current population survey data that the um, USDA uses, but then we start matching it with some American community survey data to form these regressions that look at um, poverty rates, unemployment rates, median incomes, disability rates, and home ownership, and just kind of a, um, see how rates of all those variables and counties can impact the food insecurity rate as well. So an, a really fun report to dig into. I uh, used to be a researcher on that report before uh, stepping into more of my uh, capacity building analytics role. Um, something that is important for you all to consider while you're engaging in a lot of this work related to alleviating food insecurity or finding solutions to help those um, experiencing it is that food insecurity isn't experienced um, equitably across the country. Um, so according to the USDA report, the food insecurity rate was about 10.5% uh, in 2020. But um, if we were to look at that data just um, for black non-Hispanic households, their food insecurity rate was 21.7%. So, you know, more than double what the overall rate was. And also Latino households faced um, much higher rates of food insecurity as well with them, um, those households having a food insecurity rate of 17.2%. So we're starting to see like um, some really alarming trends in the way that food insecurity is impacting different race and ethnicity groups. I mean, this is not a new 2020 issue. If, if you look at the USDA report, it shows some um, trends over time. And this is historically for, you know, as long as the report has existed, these racial disparities have existed in the way that food insecurity um, rates play out across the country. Um, another population that faces higher rates of food insecurity than um, the overall rates are rural counties. And so in the map meal gap report, we do a breakdown where we see that 63% of US counties are rural, yet, 
If you look at the counties with the highest rates of food insecurity rate, 91% uh, of them are rural. So we're seeing a really disproportionate um, impact within these geography um, disparities as well. So that's kind of been a, um, a charge and a lot of energy from the Feeding America National Office level recently around how can we target resources and efforts to better serve um, and target disparities, um, whether that be racial disparities in food insecurity or geographic disparities. And so I know that I'm like putting a lot of information out on you with, with no PowerPoint to kind of ground and look at, um, but I think that's kind of all that I'm going to do for like the, the deep dive into Feeding America and the data and the data sources available. And so now I just going to talk to you a little bit about my work and kind of um, the role I play or I see myself playing um, in alleviating food insecurity and like the grounding principles I've developed as a data analyst in this space. Um, so a key source of data that I use a lot of is publicly available data. I am always pulling data from the census portal to get a better understand of community demographics, community you know, socioeconomic status, uh, community environmental factors to try and figure out how I can pull all this data together to isolate and better understand the potential need in counties across um, the United States. And one project that I did, which I um, can share a link to, it's also going to be linked in this PowerPoint that we can send out is um, this past year, along with my other colleagues here at Feeding America and the Tableau Foundation, we put together a data visualization called Identifying Racism and the Key Drivers of Food Insecurity. And what that does is it takes those variables that I talked about and map the meal gap. So um, poverty rate, unemployment rate, median income, disability rate, and home ownership rate. Um, we can disaggregate all of those variables at the county level by race. And so my colleague and I pulled all this data, aggregated it, cleaned it up, and then put it together in a series of visualizations um, that allow users, whether it be the public or food bank staff or leaders, can play around with that data and start to see like, well, I'm seeing, you know, pretty disproportionate um, rates of poverty among Black households, um, as well as disproportionate rates of like unemployment and, you know, lower median incomes. So I can start to extrapolate and make some assumptions that food insecurity rates are also going to be, you know, have that same racial disparity underlaying them. And that was a really um, interesting project to put together and really kind of grounded me in this principle that um, I'm really lucky to get to spend my job, you know, playing around with data. It's what I really enjoy. It's my passion. And you know, why I, I come to work every day, but recognizing that that's not the case for, for all of the colleagues that I work with or interact with, you know, they have other very important jobs where they're on the ground, you know, trying to get food to people or they're making really important decisions for their organization. So thinking about how can I take all of this data that I feel comfortable with and that I'm familiar with and present it in formats that are really easy to understand and really easy to make actions and decisions based on. So taking, um, trying to figure out how the data analysis isn't just about me, but it's about the end user who's going to be using it and making sure that it's, um, you know, it's, it's suited for them. Uh, another really interesting part of my work that I do is I work individually um, with food banks um, to do some consulting work on their food, food raising, so, um, or fundraising services. And um, so what that looks like is we have some consultants on my team who are providing recommendations and doing assessments but I'll um, use food bank internal data to inform some of that. So if I were working with the food bank, um, they would send me over for a fundraising assessment, you know, five years of their fundraising data. And I could look at that to establish some trends, look for opportunities for growth, prioritize, you know, some areas that have the highest ROI and really kind of help take all this data that exists in their database and make sense of it into a way that we can act and make decisions on. And the other part of that too is, um, since Feeding America is a network of so many food banks, we have similar data points um, from across the network. So we can really start to establish really customized benchmarks of what fundraising or food sourcing looks like across um, other food banks. So really kind of industry peers and partners. We could also you know, hone in and, and dig into that more and look at it by region or look at it by similar sized food banks. And I think that this is a really fun part of my job. And another principle that I have is how can we take a lot of big data and big ideas and really synthesize that down to a local level and context. And I think that's a really special part about working in a networked organization is that, you know, if I'm working with, you know, the greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, how can I partner with them and see trends and 
and insights with them that might also apply to a food bank in LA, like across the entire country. And that we're not alone or in silos doing this work, but we're all in it together. We're all partnered, we're all networked and we can learn and grow from each other. So finding ways to take big data down to the local context. And then the last part that I wanted to share with you um, is that I do a lot of work with evaluation too. So it's one thing to come into a community organization or a food bank and present a lot of big ideas and a lot of recommendations about how we think that they'll transform their work. Um, but that's only part of the story and part of the context. I think a really beautiful part of this work is figuring out what that intersection is between data and lived experience, whether that be lived experience with food insecurity, lived experience running a food bank, working at a food bank. How can you merge these two? knowledge spheres together to find the best path forward. And so really looking for ways to solicit feedback from the organization you're working with and incorporating that feedback into your, your data analysis is so important. And I really recommend you all think about that as you endeavor on this project, that data shouldn't be a, a one-way communication where you hand over a data deck and say, okay, well, there you go, act upon this. But it's really this iterative conversation where you're sharing what you're seeing in the data, giving the community member an opportunity to respond with how that does or does not match what they're seeing in their day-to-day -day life or day-to-day -day work. And then you keep building upon this kind of shared experience of what it looks like to use data to, to impact the real lives of people in uh, organizations. So that's all that I have for you. I appreciate you bearing with me with, with no deck to guide, but I hope that this was informative and happy to answer any questions um, that you might have. Yeah, Lauren, thank you for that excellent, uh, you know, overview um, of, of, of your job in Feeding America. And, and uh, Lisa had actually teed this up a little bit in the earlier morning session about Feeding America. I did want to, uh, if you want to email um, me your deck, I'll actually, um, I, you know, I, I can email it to the group and put it in the chat too. Um, I think there's, if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. Please activate your video if that's possible for you. And, uh, you know, ask a question. I think we just had one that came in via chat as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I see a question asking um, if you're familiar with monthly public data sources for food insecurity prior to the pandemic, most seem to be annual food insecurity. So yes, I think the, the bulk of the knowledge and literature around this is the USDA report on food insecurity, which is annual. And that's really what Feeding America relies on a bit as our gold star. What has emerged is like the census during the pandemic had a pulse survey that they had coming out. And what they're measuring is, is different from food insecurity, it's food sufficiency. But I still think that that's like a valuable thing to consider. Um, make sure you read like the methodology so you understand like how food sufficiency is different than food insecurity. But I, I think that you should still feel empowered to play around with both of those sources and try to figure out a way to triangulate them to get some directional learnings. Uh, any additional questions? I actually had a question, but I'm reserving, see if a student had a question first. I had actually grabbed the uh, um, the the map uh, of your your uh, map the meal project, and I was sharing it while you're presenting. So I'm going to share again. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the underlying data sources in here. Yeah. Uh, and whether or not um, these data sources are public, or downloadable for use. Yeah. Can let's see the screen, by the way. Is that working? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the underlying data source of this are the food insecurity rates that we model internally. Um, so they're grounded in those uh, five variables that I shared before, and that's how we arrive at these numbers. Um, but the data for this is available for you all to use and access. If you go to the Feeding America, um, if you're on this page, there's like some links to the technical appendix. And within that, there's just a data request form that you fill out. I can just pull you a direct link to the data request form too. That way you don't have to click a bunch of times, um, but you can do that. And like you fill out your name and email and it will immediately send you a data set, not just for this layer of the map, you're looking at 2019 data, but it will give it for the past, I think 11 or so years. So you can really look at some trend data within that. There are some caveats that are outlined in a one pager kind of FAQ. Um, but yes, lots of data available when it comes to food insecurity rates at this level that we can get you connected to really easily. 
Yeah, and it's somebody that really appreciates uh, spatial information. And we're actually going to um, have uh, Lauren back for the Ask the Expert panel next uh, um, Friday at 1 p.m. And joining her uh, will be a person from Esri, Jim Harris, who will provide a, a recorded demonstration on his work mapping food deserts and provide um, some perspective of how uh, different information can be layered according to anything that is a uh, location specific identifier can be layered. Um, so th there's a lot of interesting applications work that they've done. Um, and that data, uh, for example, if you're downloading data from Feeding America as a location specific um, indicator, like being in a county, that can be then uh, layered against other information you may be able to pull in, uh, such as a, you know, a, a, a zip code track file that's known to be inside that uh, um, county. Also, you know, I wanted to pull out because uh, Lisa had mentioned her, the service area of the Greater Pittsburgh Fu uh, Food Bank and the 11 uh, county area. You can see this through this map. And then also, um, Lisa, you had mentioned Fayette County as being sort of the, the county with the most highest percentage of food need. Um, and I was wondering, Lisa, if you could, or, or Lauren, could you comment on, um, you know, why is it Fayette County is, has greater food need than necessarily the other counties in the area? That's a great question, Chris. I don't know, Lauren, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I think it depends on how the population is. They might have a, a higher uh, percentage of seniors, families with children, again, you know, thinking about the most vulnerable populations. I don't know if you've dug into that, Lauren. I haven't dug into this example in particular, um, but I'm guessing just from the, the model that drives this, a lot of what Lisa's saying, it's going to be the population characteristics. So um, I don't know if there's, you know, higher poverty rates or lower unemployment rates in this county, but there's going to be, you know, some sort of, you know, economic situation happening here that's a bit different than the counties surrounding it. Well, I think it also parallels to what you said about um, rural, rural poverty and also uh, hunger and food insecurity. And, and Fayette um, is rural. It's also very hilly. Um, there's a lot of mountains in Fayette County coming up part of the Appalachian chain as well. Any other questions for Lauren? And you can raise your hand or you can type it in the, the Q&A function. All right. Um, well, Lauren, I, you know, we really appreciate your being with us today. And, uh, um, you know, it's great to connect with Feeding America. Uh, we've actually included um, this as a data source as a reference in our case as well. Um, and we're going to make this recording available. All the students, we, we have a, a collection of students. Some students couldn't be available. So we'll make the recording available and the presentation available. And yeah, thank you sincerely for connecting in with us. It's it's really very much appreciated. And we have our uh, next speaker here. So Lauren, feel free to hang out. Um, and and if you want to hear about storytelling or uh, otherwise, you know, we'd just like to thank you for, you know, being a part of us. So, um, you know, on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh, thank you. Well, thank all of you. This was, um, I really enjoyed being able to take a little bit of break on my day to talk to you all. Um, I do have to run to some other meetings. I am going to hop off, but um, I'm looking forward to the future touch points and engagements that we have. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, you. Lauren. Thanks. Take Bye. care.